and I am a geriatrician um, it, in the David Geffen School of Medicine and a health services researcher. And we welcome you. Oh, I'm also the co-director of the Special Populations Hub on the CTSI. So welcome to this method seminar. First thing I would like to do is um, introduce our panelists. We're very fortunate today to have David Elishoff, who's a professor of medicine, biostatistics, and computational medicine. And among his many leadership roles, he's the director of the UCLA CTSI of Biostatistics, Epidemiology, and Research Design, known as BIRD. We also have Ram Vangala, who is a principal statistician and the associate director of the UCLA CTSI BIRD. Um, joining us a little later, I think, unless he's here already, is Dr. Kenrick Duru, who's a professor of medicine and a health services researcher also, and he is the co-PI of the UCLA Resource Center for Minority Aging Research, Center for Healthcare of Minority Elders. This is an NIA-funded center. Um, and then Dr. Chi Hong Sang could not be here today, but he really had a lot of substantive input on this um, presentation. So I wanted to be sure to thank him. He's also a professor in general internal medicine health services researchers and works with uh, Dr. Elishoff's team in Domstat. So the first thing I wanted to do is just talk a little bit about the background of how the seminar came to be. Uh, Michelle Keller, who's a health services researcher at Cedars and I were watching an NIH NIA impact collaboratory presentation by Claire Chan, and it was called Pilot and Feasibility Studies for Pragmatic Cluster RCTs. And um, I put the link there, you can watch it later if you want. It was excellent, but it really shocked me because I'm, I've been doing research for a while. I've been doing clinical trials for a long time. I've had several NIA, NIH funded clinical trials and I, other institutes. And she said that pilot studies should be all about getting the information you need to be able to do the future study and basically never ever report the effect size on your pilot study. And that seemed absolutely shocking to me because um, anyway, and then, so I ran this by uh, Ram Vangala, who I have the great opportunity to collaborate with on a number of research projects, including clinical trials. And he said, absolutely, this is very consistent with what is starting to be almost consensus in the biostatistic biostatistical world, in, particularly, in particular, Andrew Gelman and others have been, quote, quote, beating this drum, is what Ram said. And so this really, you know, as I mentioned, I've been doing research for a long time, and back when when I submitted my first um, R01 of a clinical trial, I mean, my mentors told me don't even ever think about submitting a clinical trial to NIH without having an effect size estimate from a pilot study. Um, and you know, there's there's absolutely no way you would ever get the grant. But then, um, just to reinforce how old thinking that is and how much the field has changed, Dr. Duru, Kenrick Duru sits on a study section at NIDDK where they review a lot of K awards. And he said that absolutely, in fact, he had just been at a study section where not only were they not requiring um, pilot studies with effect sizes to fund clinical trials, but they would criticize and score worse applicants who actually had the audacity to suggest that they were going to conduct a pilot study to inform their power calculation for a future randomized trial. So I thought this is a real, I talked to the KL2 director and, and it sounds like this is a topic that everyone really needs to get up to speed on. So um, the goals for today is given how this field has moved so far, how should we design pilot studies to inform future RCTs and how do we avoid the pitfalls? And then in practically, you know, there's what you do and there's the grant you write um, is given the lack of consensus by reviewers about the goals of pilot studies, what are the best strategies for grant applications, both K's and R's and you know, other non-NIH funding mechanisms. So there's really no consensus on the definition of what a pilot study is. I show a couple of the common definitions here. One definition is a test of the methods and procedures to be used on a larger scale if the pilot study demonstrates that the methods and procedures can work. So the implication here is that you might just abort your plans after your pilot study. Um, another definition that's commonly used is an investigation designed to test the feasibility of methods and procedures for later use on a large scale 
or to search for possible effects and their associations that might be worth following up in a subsequent larger study. So this one kind of walks the line about feasibility and estimating an effect size. So for the purposes of today, um, we, we're talking about small a pilot study, in, meaning any small study that's carried out in preparation for a larger investigation that is an essential precursor to a high quality clinical trial. So um, can't really start talking about pilot studies. Uh, Ram Bhagala was explaining this to me and it makes complete sense. The major, without talking about the major challenge inherent to all pilot studies, and that is the problem that inferences from pilot studies frequently result in erroneous decisions. So specifically using pilot study data to decide you know, go or stop, whether or not to conduct the full trial of the intervention at all, as well as using the pilot study data to determine how many cases to sample in such a full trial if you do decide to go forward. And before I pass the mic to the statistical experts, I wanted to give this quote that um, Chi Hong showed me in a paper that he said he strongly agreed with by Westland. And I have all the citations at the end of the presentation. Um, but the the philosophy is researchers conducting randomized experiments should never use pilot study effect sizes alone to determine whether a full trial should be conducted. Full trials should always be powered to conduct a predetermined level of practical or clinical significance rather than based on the effect size observed in a small pilot study. So the outline for today is um, Ram Vangala is going to illustrate for us using this really cool website how inferences from pilot studies result in these erroneous decisions. Then Dr. Elishoff is going to talk about some of the good and bad ways to think about the design, sample size, outcome metrics of pilot studies based on his many years of experience serving on CTSI review panels. So these are the panels that review the huge CTSA applications from across, across the country, as well as he's going to talk about when we are designing the later phase studies right. for grant application, how should we use the information from the pilot studies? And Dr. Elishoff has you know, been involved in dozens, if not hundreds of grant applications. Um, and then he's also seen the various study section responses of this, making this leap from the pilot study data to the clinical trial data. And then we'll also have the opportunity to hear from Dr. Duru about study section strategies based on his experience reviewing mostly K awards, I think, but also R01s. And then we'll leave time for question and answer. Uh, so I am going to stop sharing my screen. And Ram, I didn't know, yeah, I'll let you share your screen. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, give me one second. Can you see that? Yes. Great. Yes. Um, so as, as Catherine mentioned, um, what I'll be talking about is sort of pilot studies and how they're frequently used and, and misused in informing decisions about uh, clinical trial design. Uh, so what do I mean by a pilot study? And this is somewhat reiterating what Catherine was saying. Um, a common definition is that a pilot study is sort of a small scale version of a proposed clinical trial. So for example, we might have in mind a multi-center clinical trial, and as a pilot, we might just run a single center. That would be one sort of way of thinking about a scaled back version of a trial. But most often what we're talking about is the sample size being what's scaled back. So we envision running essentially the same thing as what we plan for the full trial, but we just run it with a smaller sample size. Um, and <clears throat> in terms of how the results of pilot studies are commonly used, uh, Catherine mentioned the sort of two major ones, which is one is deciding whether to proceed with the trial at all. And there's a feasibility aspect to that, which I think we'll talk about more later. But here, what I'm talking about is deciding on the basis of whether the treatment looks promising. So we might look at the treatment effect estimate and say, hey, it looks like, you know, we might have something clinically meaningful here. We should go ahead and do the trial. Um, or we might see that it's not clinically meaningful and decide not to do the trial on that basis. Um, and if we do decide to do the trial frequently, we'll use the pilot study results to, uh, you know, determine our sample size. And Catherine mentioned that, you know, there's increasing concern about this, and that's sort of what I'll try to illuminate. So what's, what's the problem with this sort of standard kind of way of using pilot studies? The basic issue is that when we talk about small scale, essentially what we're saying is that it's, it's really not up to the task that we're, we're using it for. If you think about it, you know, if a pilot study was big enough to draw conclusions about treatment effects, it wouldn't be a pilot study, it would be the trial itself. So in a sense, by saying that you're dealing with a pilot study, you're already saying that this is really not up to the task of, of you know, answering questions about treatment effects. 
And what does it mean that it's not up to the task? It basically means that it's producing really noisy estimates of what the treatment effect is. And that has to do with the fact that it's using a small sample size. And the problem is when you have a noisy treatment effect estimate and you use that as an input into a decision, like whether to conduct the trial or what sample size to use, you're going to end up making um, erroneous decisions on that basis. So I think qualitatively that, that sort of makes sense to people, but I think it's useful to sort of see quantitatively how bad this, this problem can get even in a fairly sort of conventional scenario. So um, I did this simulation study using that that website that Catherine mentioned, though I just sort of covered it in slides here for now. Um, but just to sort of set this up for you, the sort of trial we're envisioning is a simple two-arm randomized trial, treatment versus control. It's a balanced design, so we're going to put the same number of subjects in, in both arms. We're looking at some sort of a quantitative endpoint, so maybe it's blood pressure, maybe it's some clinical biomarker. Um, and we're just going to assume for simplicity that it has a standard deviation of one, so just to keep the sort of math simple. And the analysis plan we have for this trial is a very simple two-sample t-test. We're going to do the usual two-sided 5% significance level. And our hope is to design the trial so that it has 80% power to detect the, the treatment effect. And in this scientific scenario, what we're going to stipulate is that what it takes for an effect size to be clinically meaningful is that it's 0.2 or bigger. Where do I get 0.2? Somewhat arbitrary, but you know, there's this widely cited source, uh, Cohen, on effect sizes, and his concept of a small effect size is 0.2. So you could think that sort of an effect size smaller than 0.2 is sort of smaller than small, uh, which you know you can sort of think of as clinically negligible. So you know, intuitively, we we're interested in effects that are bigger than 0.2, smaller than that. We don't think that it's it's very interesting. So we're going to do a pilot study um, before designing our trial, and our pilot is simply gonna be the trial itself, but scaled back to a sample size of 30. This is a typical sample size I often see people use for pilot studies. Um, and what this means with two arms is that we're gonna have 15 subjects per condition. So how are we gonna use the results of the pilot? Well, you know, first what we're gonna do is we're gonna check the estimated effect size, and we're gonna see whether it's clinically meaningful, meaning is it bigger than 0.2? If it is, then we're gonna say, okay, we're gonna run the trial. If it's not, if it's something less than 0.2, we're going to say, okay, probably we're not going to proceed with the trial because this treatment doesn't look very interesting. The second thing we're going to do is if we do proceed to the trial, we're going to use the effect size that we see in the pilot to do our power calculation. And so on the basis of that power calculation, we're going to decide the sample size for the trial and then run the trial with that sample size. So what I've just described, this methodology is something we can actually simulate. And so what I'm going to do is I'm basically going to simulate uh, you know, 30 patients for a pilot study I'm going to analyze their data. I'm going to use that analysis to design the trial if we're going to pursue a trial. And then I'm going to simulate the trial data and analyze that. And I'm going to do that a thousand times. And that's going to give us a sense of how this methodology sort of behaves when you apply it repeatedly to, um, to data sets like this. So I'm going to sort of illustrate this with two scenarios. In the first scenario, the true effect size here is 0.1. So 0.1 is 50% you know, smaller than what we think of as a meaningful effect, okay? So in this scenario, the true effect size is not clinically meaningful, right? It's less than 0.2. And so in an ideal world, if we, if we knew this, we wouldn't bother running the trial because you know, this is just not a very interesting treatment effect. So the question is, given the methodology I just described, which is again, fairly standard, you know, how often would we accidentally run the trial when we really shouldn't be? It turns out the answer is 41% of the time, which is a lot. Um, you know, if you think about flipping a coin to decide whether to run the trial, you're going to run it 50% of the time. So we're really only doing slightly better than a coin flip here. And think about all the resources that go into running a pilot like this, and sometimes the ethical dilemmas that are involved in, in running a pilot like this. Um, you know, just to do slightly better than a coin flip in making this decision seems, seems pretty bad. Um, why is this happening? Well, <clears throat> what's displayed here in this figure is sort of the distribution across simulations of the uh, treatment and control group means. So we're you know, simulating a pilot study and in each pilot study, we have a treatment group and a control group and we calculate their means. And then we have a thousand of these because we do a thousand studies. And so the blue distribution is sort of the distribution of the treatment group averages and the gray is the control group averages. What you can see is the distributions are not very separated because the effect size is small by assumption. However, the spread is really wide. And in fact, the two distributions are largely on top of each other. Why is the spread so wide? Because the pilot study is small. When you have a small study, your results are very sensitive to the particular patients that are in your study. 
And so each time we look at a different study, we're getting different patients and so we're getting very different results. And so as a result of this, we can see anything from a huge positive treatment effect to a huge negative treatment effect to small positive or negative treatment effects to no treatment effect at all. We can really see a, a wide range of things. And it turns out that in this particular scenario, 41% of the time, we see effects that are bigger than that 0.2 threshold. So we end up proceeding to trial in 41% of cases where really we shouldn't be running this trial at all. So this seems like a pretty big error. And it's driven by the small sample size of the pilot. But now in this 41% where we did see uh, you know, an effect size justifying the trial, now what we wanna do is power that trial um, to detect that effect size. And what you're seeing here is the distribution of sample sizes that are sort of induced by the effect sizes from the pilots that, that you know, generated a full trial. And it turns out that the average sample size that this justified was 239, which is this dashed line you see here. Um, but the real question is what sample size do we need to detect the actual effect here, which is 0.1. It turns out that that sample size is 3,142. So basically you need an absolutely massive sample size to detect this effect, but following this very reasonable seeming methodology, on average, you're gonna run a, a trial that's only 239 subjects. So this gives you a sense of how massively underpowered um, this study is gonna be. But you might think that that's just the average case scenario, but it turns out that if you look at this distribution, it really only goes out to about 800. So none of these simulations that become anywhere close to determining the actual sample size that we need to detect the, the true effect. So this is something going very wrong with this, this overall procedure in terms of deciding how, how to power our, our subsequent trial. So that's scenario one where the effect size is, is 0.1. Now we're gonna consider scenario two where it's 0.3. So this is a case where we have a clinically meaningful treatment effect. Um, and so in, a re, you know, in an ideal world, we would run the trial um, if this was the treatment effect we were dealing with. So the question now is how often are we failing to run the trial, right? How often are we not running the trial, even though we should? It turns out here, the answer is 38%. So again, we're actually pretty close to that 40% error rate that we were seeing before. Um, so even though this is a useful treatment and should be studied, 38% of the time we actually decide not to do it. And again, it's for the same reasons, even though the treatment effect is bigger, so you can see the distributions are more separated, the spread is still enormous. It's uh, enormous because of the, the small sample size of the pilot. And so because of that variability, because of that noise, again, we can see anything from large treatment effects to small treatment effects to negative treatment effects. And it turns out that in 38% of cases, we see treatment effects that are below that 0.2 threshold. And so we don't proceed to trial, even though we really ought to here. So again, even though this is a case where we do have a treatment effect um, and a non-trivial one at that, it actually seems like we're uh, you know, making the wrong decision still about 40% of the time. And in the cases here where we do proceed to a trial, so this is 62% of the time that we do run the trial, when we power those trials, it turns out that we, on average, pick 205 subjects, uh, which is this dashed line here. Now for this effect size, we only need 352, which is a lot better than 0.1. However, 352 is still a lot bigger than 205. So we're still gonna be pretty underpowered. And if you look at the graph here, 352 is maybe right around here. And as you can see, the vast majority of scenarios are to the left of this. And so what that means is that the vast majority of the time, we're gonna be choosing sample sizes that are too small, given what's required for the actual effect size. So even though we have a treatment effect here um, and it's a non-trivial one, um, you know, it seems like we're still massively underpowering our, our study compared with what we really wanna be doing. So what are the results of these actual trials? Well, in scenario one, where we hit the small effect, um, it turns out that we only actually get a statistically significant difference in the trial 13% of the time. Uh, in scenario two, we get it 48% of the time. Now, 48% might sound a lot better than 13%, but remember that the goal here was 80% power. So 80% power means we should be seeing a statistically significant difference 80% of the time, but we're actually seeing much, much less than that. So despite our intention to get 80% power, the methodology I just described really is actually resulting in us having some very, very low power compared with that. So we're ending up with you know, really underpowered trials regardless of whether there is a clinically meaningful effect or not. And either way, we make the wrong decision about whether to even do the trial about 40% of the time. Um, you know, whether that's when we should run the trial, 40% of the time we're not running it, or when we shouldn't run the trial, 40% of the time we, we are running it. So um, I wanna just conclude with some, some general thoughts that occurred to me in, in sort of reflecting on this. Um, <clears throat> you know, the first thought is, 
that one thing we need to do is take pilot study design as seriously as clinical trial design. Um, you know, often people will spend a lot of time trying to get a really good clinical trial design. And then for the pilot, the thinking is as simple as just shrink it to whatever we can do, right? 30 subjects, because that's what we can afford before the study. That's unfortunately just not uh, taking into account how the pilot study is going to be used. If it's going to be used in such an important way in terms of deciding whether to do the trial and how to power it, you really need to do things to try to make this pilot study less noisy. And so you really need to think about design, not just sample size, but you know, in this particular example, sample size is really the key issue. Um, the second thought is that we ought to fully utilize the background information that we have. Um, you know, generally, when we go into a, a trial design exercise, the pilot study data is not the only information we have, right? We have theory from our subject matter knowledge. We have uh, previous studies. We have just general reasoning skills that we can sort of apply to these things. And all of this can sort of paint a picture about whether it's plausible to expect the treatment to have an effect, as well as, you know, what sort of effect size we think is reasonable to base a power calculation on. Um, in this scenario where we have lots of such information, a noisy pilot really shouldn't change the story at all because it's just not adding much information to that. Um, and so I think utilizing the information that we do have is, is really critical. But now you might say, well, I'm not in a position to change the study design for the pilot because I only have as many subjects as I have. I only have as many resources as I have. And I don't have that much background information. So what should I do? I really need to run this noisy pilot. There, my advice is don't focus on the point estimate for the treatment effect, focus on the confidence interval because the confidence interval also incorporates the uncertainty. And the whole issue with pilot studies is that they're very uncertain. The point estimate sort of masks that. It gives you the illusion that you sort of have some idea of what the treatment effect is, but a really wide confidence interval is an indication that you actually have no idea what the treatment effect is. And so looking at the confidence interval and saying, is the bulk of it consistent with a clinically meaningful effect? That's a good reason to sort of start a trial. If the CI is mostly consistent with a non-meaningful effect, or if it's consistent with both, that's either telling you that you shouldn't run the trial or that the pilot is just not informative enough to support a decision like that. So I think focusing on the confidence interval is a good way to sort of avoid the kind of you know, catastrophic errors that I've been sort of illustrating on the previous slides. And the last point is when you're doing your power calculation, think about what's a minimum clinically meaningful treatment effect to power on rather than what your pilot study found. And the reason is because if you're powered to detect the smallest clinically meaningful effect, you're powered to detect any clinically meaningful effect. And so as long as your treatment has a clinically meaningful effect, you will be powered to detect it. So this is generally becoming the, the advice, and I think we're going to talk more about this uh, with the panel, but you know, the question I want to throw out at this point is sort of how to decide what that is. Because while I think philosophically it's, it's the right thing to do and it sort of makes sense, uh, coming to a non-arbitrary decision about what constitutes the smallest clinically meaningful effect in any scenario is, is I think, a challenge. And so that's, that's something to, uh, to keep in mind. So just um, my references here, um, Catherine actually cited this paper earlier, this Westland paper. This is a, a paper where they do a lot of simulation studies like the one I just illustrated here. And they developed this web app, which I've linked here where you can run simulations like the one I just ran yourself. You can see whether I cherry pick the numbers and whether you can get better results with different numbers or if you're, you yourself are designing a pilot study right now uh, for intention to use for a clinical trial, you can sort of plug in the numbers here to get a sense of how bad the problems that I've just described are if you plan to sort of proceed in this traditional way. So I'll stop there, turn it back to Catherine. Thank you so much, Ram. That was really uh, depressing uh, but, and disheartening. It makes you think of all, this, all the studies out there that are funded based on these erroneous uh, pilot studies. So thank, I appreciate you focusing um, on the positives at the end, the very constructive, focusing on the confidence intervals. It's great. Perfect segue to Dr. Elishaw. I think, I think one of the critical things there is that, you know, part of the problem gets induced by that sort of the creating that sort of artificial decision point based on the observed effect size. And when you, when you use a small sample size and then have that sort of artificial decision point, then it will lead you astray many times because there's a lot more there's a lot more variability than you would kind of expect going into it. Um, so I can, I have a few, I have a, a small number of slides. Um, um, so I'll, I'll start. Um, so I, I, one of the, one of, one of the hats I wear is that I am one of the statisticians on the CTSI scientific review committee. So that's, um, 
the institutional review committee where we look at clinical trials that will be done at UCLA. Um, and over the past four years, I think we've seen about 750 clinical trials come through the, come through the committee. And many times we see pilot studies um, and many times they're poorly designed and justified. So I want to hit just a few, a, a few sort of points that I see um, as sort of problematic um, multiple times. So, um, you know, one, one of the, the biggest questions we often, uh, as, as a statistician, get is obviously how, how do you, what sample size should I use for my study? And um, if you, um, <clears throat> and this can be particularly hard with a pilot study. So, um, you know, the, the, the first question that a statistician will, will always ask when, um, for any trial design is what, what is the outcome, um, what is the primary outcome of the trial, what do you really want to learn with, with this trial? Um, and sort of late stage trials, we, we usually focus on we usually focus on the efficacy of the intervention and often we'll also discuss safety as, as potentially a secondary endpoint. Um, for a pilot trial, though, we efficacy may be sort of the last consideration that we should we should um, think about trying to to evaluate. And often, it's more important to really evaluate feasibility, um, potentially safety, and then maybe or maybe not really get into a measurement of efficacy. Um, so. Um, there, there's an, a number of different ways to try and justify the sample size for a pilot trial, um, and you know the, these are, these are some of the things that I will these these are some of the common things that I will see um, used to to justify the sample size. I would say the most common approach that to use to justify sample size for a pilot trial is the the none approach, <laughs> where there is there is no justification at all for the sample size, and that seems bad, but may not be quite as bad as we think it is. Um, because the conventional ways that we use to, to, to evaluate what the sample size should be are really all often all about statistical power, right? How many, how many subjects do we need to be able to obtain 80% power to, uh, to detect a statistical difference between our treatment groups? That's, that's the, the general goal of a, of a clinical trial, but is not the goal for a pilot trial. Um, and so in the absence of the, so if, if, if we can't justify it based on statistical power, often um, investigators are left kind of throwing up their hands and saying, well, I don't really know how to justify this. Um, sometimes I will see pilot trials where the investigator thinks that they have to be able to demonstrate a statistically significant result. So we'll try and still say that even with 20 subjects per group, that they are gonna have 80% power to detect a statistically significant difference between the groups. And usually that's based on sort of a, a wildly over-optimistic estimate of how big the effect will be um, and is potentially even worse <laughs> in some sense than doing the none approach because you're, you're, you're basing your sample size on something that's you know, sort of very unlikely to be true, which is a huge effect that could be detected in a small study. Um, so you know, the choice for May, may often be the worst approach for choosing sample size for a trial. The, the non approach can be good um, in some senses, just because, you know, there's sort of often kind of basic rules of thumb of, about how many subjects, you know, you might, you might want to include in a pilot study, you know, 15, 20, or 25 thing, kind of numbers like that. And, you know, often that will likely give us kind of the information that we need. Now, the other, um, the other way people will justify this, the sample size of a pilot study is based on the idea that we're using the pilot study to estimate something. And the most common idea is we, that is to use the, the pilot study to say estimate an effect size. Um, and that's that's sort of Ram, Ram's discussion was sort of centered around this, this idea that, that the end goal is to, to, to estimate an effect size. But um, as, as Catherine was mentioning, this, this idea is not particularly in favor at NIH and for good reason. Um, and in, in fact, if you read the RFAs for, for many um, pilot study um, um, 
grant, grant opportunities, they specifically say that the point of the pilot study is not to estimate an effect size and that they will not fund grants where the, the goal is to estimate an effect size. Um, and this is for, for many of the reasons that, that Ram discussed, that, that our estimate is very likely to be noisy and very, and it may not really provide a, a good basis for us to, to estimate the sample size for our, for our long-term study. So, but th there are lots of things we can learn from a pilot study. Um, as Ron, Ron mentioned, we can we can calculate, say, the confidence interval for the effect and see, you know, is is much of the confidence interval in a region where we would think that that would be encouraging for us to want to run a trial. So if if much of the confidence interval includes regions that where the effect is sort of clinically meaningful, that that's potentially a good reason to to go ahead. Um, but we can also estimate a lot of things that could help us in properly designing our next trial. We could look at, say, diff various different rates. So we could look at the dropout rate, for example. We could look at the rate of you know, subjects refusing randomization. We could look at um, the, um, the uh, rate of subjects adhering to the treatment. So these, these are all things that are, are incredibly important um, parameters in, in doing a sample size calculation for a later trial. And we're often, with, in the absence of a pilot study, we're often just totally guessing what those, what those things would be. So, so those, those are great things to, to use to sort of, as a rationale for why we want to do the pilot study, because we, we really need those things. The other component is not just the, the sort of the mean treatment effect, but the variability in our in our sort of outcome measures. And so this can actually be quite important. So if we want to to justify our um, our clinical trial to say if, if we're doing a blood pressure intervention and we think lowering blood pressure by 15 millimeters of mercury is, is an important clinical difference. Well, that's good, but we also need to know how much variability would we expect to see in the sort of the change in blood pressure. Now, maybe there's some good literature to suggest what that variability might be, but if if we if we don't have good data on that, um, we can use a pilot study to estimate this variability, which will be a very important component of the sample size calculation. And and often you even with a modest sample size, we can get a decent estimate of what the amount of variability in our in, in some of our measures might be. So so even though it, it doesn't seem like a, a very exciting thing that we could do, this is actually very useful in being able to estimate. Um, the, the last thing I'll mention here is this concept of the probability of detection. So um, often one of the goals of a pilot study is to look at um, things like safety or ex acceptability. And sometimes we're trying to, to, particularly for safety data, to try and say, well, at what you know, probability of, a, say, a serious adverse event are we willing to, to say, proceed with a, with a clinical trial if we see that half our patients are having a serious adverse event, we may not want to run that in a, in a large clinical trial. But with a, with a small trial, we can, we can essentially estimate what um, we can calculate ahead of time, sort of assuming, say, that the adverse events are occurring at, say, a 10% rate. What's the chance that we would be able to detect that, that adverse event in our study um, with the sample size that we have. So this, we can, we can sort of this, do this pre-calculation of, well, at what percentage um, rate would, would an adverse event be something that we would maybe not want to proceed with our study and, and, what, and we can design our study to say, well, we, we want to, if there's a, say a 10% rate, we want to have a good chance of being able to detect that adverse event. Um, I'll give you a, a quick example of a NH-funded pilot study that Ram and I um, have been involved in. This is a um, this is a study called Prevent DT, um, and the this first sentence is essentially our aim one of our pilot clinical trial that was funded, and the pilot randomized clinical trial. The objective is to assess the feasibility for enrollment, um, the feasibility for randomizing, um, and and it, into the different treatment strategies, safety, um, and whether we could retain participants um, and, and use sort of all these different components to, to better design and power a, the future randomized clinical trial. So it's to estimate a number of parameters, notably where effect size is not one of them. Um, now, 
we had, in, in this case, the investigator that we worked with had a fair amount of preliminary data on the utility of this treatment. And so we performed a, a full-scale power calculation on the basis of the, the, um, the data that had already been obtained to say, what would the final sample size number need to be? And we, um, we then planned for this pilot study to enroll 20% of the final study population. Now, where did 20% come from? Some, some arbitrary. Um, you know, should it should it have been 10%? Should it have been 30%? You know, there's not there's not a specific right answer, but we felt that, that with this 20%, we could get a fairly good idea of sort of the, these sort of top level parameters. Uh, so, um, and of course, the, the larger the pilot study, the, the better we what we should be able to estimate the parameters and better able to to run our next stage trial. Um, quickly moving on um, to the sort of statistical evaluation of trial design. So this, this, this is more not evaluating trials that are coming pilot studies, but evaluating how, um, what, what strategies people use to justify the sample size for sort of the full scale, for the full scale clinical trials. Um, of course, as, as I mentioned, for we, we always need to start with what our primary outcome is, and we're generally powering our study based on that primary outcome. Um, in some cases, we may also perform power calculations for a secondary outcome, but that's not what's going to drive our sample size um, to begin with. Um, and one of, one of the hardest things to do is to decide what, what, what is the effect that you're going to power your study for. Um, we obviously have to have some for for a regular scale trial the, with the objective of proving the intervention is 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 valuable. We 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 need to we need to be able to convince the study section that that we're we our sample size is reasonable and is and has good likelihood of being able to demonstrate that our that our intervention has an effect, supposing that it actually does have an effect. Um, and so certainly, if there are pilot data that pilot data is useful. Now, as Ram mentioned, it's likely that if the pilot study is relatively small, that that pilot effect size is probably gonna be an overestimate of the true effect. Um, and um, so one thing that I will typically suggest to my collaborators is um, particularly in the, if we have multiple different pieces of information, if there's, if there's multiple different studies in the literature around similar topics, that we can look at sort of the different studies and potentially choose an effect size on the low range of the effect sizes that are observed in the literature. Because we know that studies that demonstrate no effect are generally not published. Um, and so the, the sort of the highest effect size are just the, you know, when, when things happen to work out sort of optimally and probably don't represent the, 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 the real scenario of what we're going to encounter with our studies. So trying to, you know, potentially choosing sort of something close to the minimum of what, what's, what's seen in the literature would be a, a better guess than, than choosing like the, the average or sort of on the higher end, um, you know, um, as, as Juan was mentioning, you know, looking at the minimally clinically important difference, you know, this, this, a lot of journals like this approach. I know that um, JAMA, for example, um, they had an editor of JAMA talk to one of my classes, and he said that this is, this is what they really focus on is, is not just whether the, uh, the eventual p-value for the, the clinical trial was significant, but, um, you know, is the difference that was observed clinically important. Um, now I, I mentioned that one of one you know we not only have sort of the value of that clinical important difference, but we, we need to get a standard deviation, and this 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 standard deviation can can definitely come from a pilot study. Um, so um, you know certainly other other approaches are looking at other interventions within the same within the same area or a similar intervention applied to other populations to try and get some sense of what what's sort of a, a reasonable 
um, sort of effect. Um, but ultimately, often this comes down to a combination of approaches where we'd like to kind of see that the minimally clinically important difference has some correspondence also to what, what we might have seen in, in prior literature or prior interventions um, so that we can sort of take all these pieces of information together and come up with something reasonable. Um, because, you know, the sample size calculations are not is, is not exactly a science. <laughs> it's 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 trying to gather as much you know as much information as we can from multiple sources and try and come up with a sort of a consensus reasonable decision. Um, I'm looking at the time. I, I don't. I think maybe I'm going to skip my second example to allow uh, Kenrick to have uh, some time. Thanks, David. Sure. That was great. It's really. Uh... Really interesting. I still feel I'm hoping Kenrick can really shed light on the perspective from the study section because I still um, I still feel like we're hearing contradictory message about uh, you know you, that you have a bullet there saying the pilot study effect size is part of the formula. So okay, Kenrick, teach us, sure. please. Well, no, no. I, first of all, I defer to everything that the statisticians before me have said. I think that's critical. One thing I'll say is you know I agree with them. I think citing the paper that Ram mentioned will be important. I will say, like uh, Catherine mentioned, I just came off six years of case study section. I've done some ad hoc R study sections. And there's always a few reviewers who may not understand or agree. We often have folks who are retired, who have more time and come back to study section. So if there's a citation as to why this is accepted and appropriate, that will always help you and, and doesn't hurt. So, um, so I just basically have no slides, but maybe four points to make. And the first one is just to say how important pilot studies are. I think we're, we're talking a lot about, you know, how to do them, how to do them, but you really need to do them. I can tell you from my own experience and from also being on study section that the greatest ideas, or at least mine that I thought were the greatest ideas, will get shot down if you really don't have pilot studies. I think NIH often wants to fund things that they know have already been done or that you can definitely do and not take flyers on things um, that may or may not happen. I think, you know, these days there's so many great scientists submitting really great grants and people come in just waiting to pick holes in anything. I think reviewers don't want to give everyone, a, you know, a one or a two, right? So there anything they can find to knock a grant down, they will. And the absence of pilot study is a big thing that will happen. So just so important to do them. And I guess we're talking about how to do them right. So um, that's the first thing. The second thing is, like has been said, it really is supposed to be, you know, feasibility, acceptability. I think the work that I do is not dangerous, we believe to people, but like David said, safety in some settings is critical and then efficacy is at the bottom of the list. So, uh, you know, feasibility, I think NIH is more and more getting tired of funding big R studies that are intervention studies where they can't recruit. And then investigators will say, well, we have this problem, we have that problem. And at the end of the day, we don't get enough people to show the effect size that we were powered to show we're not hitting that. So, you know, now we have, of course, the just-in-time requirements to get the IRB accepted before you start. And Catherine knows this, I'm sure as well, the NIA just, I think in the last few months is saying that every intervention has to update their recruitment every single month to the NIA. You have to submit every month. We have this many people this many people, this many people. There's a big push to make sure that, you know, we are getting to the finish line that we say we're gonna do in our beautiful grants. And so I think if you can do a pilot study showing the feasibility, now really pay attention to, you know, this is our denominator of recruitment. We were able to recruit X people. We reached out to X number, we recruited Y number, we did it in Z time. If you can show you can recruit in that time frame, that will really help a lot. That will impress the study section that you know what you're doing, you're not just having ideas, you're able to make it happen. So I think the feasibility of that is so critical. And the second thing then, like I mentioned, is acceptability. So it really has to be acceptable. And so I would really take time to, as best you can, you know, talk to the, not only the participants, of course, to make sure that they were okay with it, right? This is something that a larger group of people would not just refuse to participate in, but also the staff implementing it. And if you're in a clinic, kind of the doctors, the workflow, so both the participants, the study staff, those who are involved, everybody agrees this makes sense and, and this is a go. Again, if you can do that, those people who would be skeptical and say, well, this is great, but this will never work in a busy primary care clinic, you know, they'll be uh, kind of assured that you actually have thought about that. So you know, really just making sure it's feasible and it's acceptable are really the two key things in my mind. And, and like David said, safety in, in some cases. 
Um, and then I think the big question we've kind of been talking about is what is the right number? And I guess David sent off at none is, is not so bad. And I looked <laughs> at a paper before, or in terms of how to, how to come up with the right number. So um, I looked at a paper and basically anywhere from 20 to 55 seems to be in a sweet spot. And I can't give you anything besides my own just stall. Because if you have too few, people will say this is a waste of time. It's not helping me if you do 10 people randomize five and five. That's not enough to show that you can actually do this, but there's beware of this zone of like a hundred pilot people, because then you're in no person's land and someone is gonna say, why are they spending time and money getting that many? You know, if you did 50, you'd be fine. Why are we doing a hundred? It doesn't make sense. You're not gonna be able to get the effect size that you might need. You might as well just go ahead and do the full study, right? So Anywhere from that 20 to 55 number is good, but I think you have to, can't just say that. You have to kind of give an explanation for why you came upon that, but beware of any pilot study in my mind that has less than 20 people or more than 55, something you can even go to 65, 70, depending on your study, but just be careful that you don't go too many and end up in the in-between in between place. Um, and then I think the fourth thing is just to say that, uh, you know, Sometimes there's a temptation to do a one-arm pre-post study because your resources are limited. But when you think about feasibility, acceptability, and that also is you know, recruitment and follow-up, reviewers, and I've seen this in the last few years, want to see that you can actually uh, recruit and, and enroll intervention and control and follow them and get follow-up data, right? And so I think there's other ways of doing it. You can do crossover studies, whatever it is. You want to be sure you have a control group, not so much to look at effect size in my mind, comparing intervention versus control, but that you're able to enroll a control group and keep them in and check. Because again, if you can, you can't keep people into the time point that you're talking about, that raises red flags, right? Well, they can recruit, but can they retain and follow up, especially someone who's really not getting the attention that intervention group might. So pilot studies are critical. I think feasibility, acceptability, 20 to 55 to me is a sweet spot. And, and I know it's, um, challenging and I think resources are often limited, but try to get a control group in your study versus uh, just a one arm pre post trial, I think. Um, and then just the very last thing is, uh, you know, sometimes I think if your mentor pushes back on this uh, and says, you know, you need an effect size, uh, really, I would try to get the references, you can cite this talk, you can just say that, you know, talking to statisticians, that's not the way to go. I think not everyone is on board yet. Um, but you don't want to um, go to a study section, I think, with, with a defined effect size plan that gets kind of chewed up and, and you have to go back to drawing board. So uh, I wouldn't let necessarily mentors who may not be statisticians or up to speed kind of uh, have you afraid and feeling like you have to do an effect size uh, calculation. So I think, Catherine, those are the main points I had. But uh, of course, if there are questions related to study section, I'm not happy to answer those. That is so helpful, Kenrick. Thank you. Did I understand you correctly in your email that you actually were seeing K award applicants uh, get worse scores? Was I correct because they were hanging their hat too much on the effect size observed, in, estimated in the pilot study? Yeah, I would say so. I think, you know, sometimes from a two to a three or a mm -hmm. three to a four, I mean, it's not going to like totally sink it, but obviously you want to get the best score that you can. So if you have to resubmit, you know, you have a, a better chance. So yeah. I would say, yeah, I think there are going to be people there more and more, I think more every year who are looking for this. And, you know, like I said, they, there's so many smart people submitting case, any excuse to knock it down, people will jump yeah. on. And I think this is one of them. Yeah, that's great. I mean, maybe just one, one extra comment there. I mean, my, my understand, my, my understanding of this is in some sense that, that, you know that the the point of the study should not be to to calculate the effect size. It's not that preliminary data is found upon um, to inform what 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 we're doing. It's just that the point of the the trial should not just be to estimate an effect size as the sort of the the outcome of interest. And, and that's something that to be that um, is is going to do very poorly and and and, and very specifically kind of kind of contradicts many of the set the um, and guidelines in terms of pilot studies. Yes, thank you, Dave. So I would say one thing I've seen is people often say exploratory, we're looking at these outcomes in an exploratory way. I'm not, not sure your thoughts on that, but that's a way to ask them and get them without committing to like you're saying that this is the primary outcome and we're gonna use this to then pilot the next study. 
Um, let me share a, my screen again to show you this slide from Claire Chan's um, talk where she, um, she, in terms of this issue, can you see this advice for the literature slide? So these are the papers that she cited that sort of were talking about the rule of thumb of sample size. And I'm curious, David and Ram, do you agree with kind of these numbers? Um, kind of although Stallard see, sounds, yeah. I kind of get nervous when I see rules of thumb because yeah. you know what, what the right sample size is for any scenario depends on a whole bunch of things that are not mm -hmm. gonna be in common between any two studies. Um, probably, you know, and, and Kenrick and David can speak more to, you know, what, you know, what sort of justification will sort of pass study section muster in, in different types of study sections. But sort of if I'm looking at this, you know, if, if I'm looking for a justification saying that, you know, some paper says 30 is good for pilot studies feels like a not adequate justification to me, you know, I'd, I'd want to see something more about you know, what, what is the goal of the pilot study? Is it a feasibility study? And if it's a feasibility study, what is our measure of feasibility and how, what are we exactly trying to demonstrate with it? Is it a, you know, classic pilot study where we are looking at effect size, but then how are we going to sort of report that? Are we going to just focus on a point estimate in which case you really we need to show a proper power calculation or are we, you know, just trying to get a, get a sort of interval estimate, like a confidence interval, and then tell me something about what kind of confidence interval that sample size is going to help you pin down or like David was saying, maybe using it to figure out something like variability for power calculation, but not sort of effect size, you know, sort of some link between the number you're providing, what your goal is, and some kind of contextual information about the scenario feels like a minimum, whether it has to be as extensive as a trial justification for power is, is, is maybe different, but um, I'm, I'm always a little bit nervous with rules of thumb like this, which I think is sort of running together a lot of different scenarios that, that aren't really comparable. I, I think often you you do get the sort of gestalt ideas about what the, what what a, what a reasonable sample size is, and I think what Kenrick was talking about, you know, this twenty to fifty ish, you know, kind of fits with what what I think people often feel like is kind of a, about the right range, and you know, for if they're able to provide some additional justification of why that number is about right, but right that. You know, 10, feel, 10 feels way too small, 100 is, is no longer a pilot study. Um, you know, you, you often get this in, in, in manuscripts that you write where people will say, well, the sample size is small, you know, regardless of whether the effect was significant or not, right? There, there, there's this, there's uh, these kind of in general, you know, sort of biases maybe in, in the, of what what we think of as, as, as about the right number that is kind of needed. And if you're stray too far from that range, um, you know, some of these ones, like the three percent, you know, that would have to be if the, if the if the eventual trial was going to be gigantic. If the eventual trial was a hundred, then three <laughs> percent is uh, is not going to get you anything useful. Good point. And then I have one more slide. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. I came across. Let's see if I can advance here. How do I do that? Just one more quick comment oh, on before we before we move on. Um, I, I do some work with uh, investigators who do animal studies. And often in these studies, they're able to sort of so control the environment that they really do get these enormous effect sizes because they're able to sort of reduce the variability so much. And in that case, the actual trial may only need six animals or something like that, you know, in, in, a, in a particular case. And so a rule of thumb that says, you know, 30 is for the pilot, you know, might work for certain sort of clinical scenarios. But that's just sort of one example of how sort of a different context could sort of mean that, you know, 30 may be way more than you actually need um, in some cases or way less than you actually need. So. Good point. Um, are there questions from the group? I had asked if people want to put them in chat, but I didn't see any come in. Um, in, in while we're waiting for questions, I know we only have a couple more minutes. Uh, what, is, what do our panelists think about this list? Well, I guess the first bullet is what David specifically said in terms of outcomes from a pilot study beyond the efficacy estimates. Yeah, this looks consistent with what you were saying to Kenrick. Oh, here's a chat. Yes. No, I was just agreeing with Ram that I've seen, yeah, everything I said does not uh, apply to animal studies and basic lab studies. I think that that's a very different thing. And I've seen, you know, 10, 10 animals or even fewer. Uh, I can't speak to that, but I, I will say, please don't apply this to that setting. But I agree, Catherine. I think what you're saying, these are the kind of things that I would put in there. It's going to make you look good that you're, you're measuring these. 
um, uh, carefully. And then uh, just recruitment. Think you need to show that you can you can recruit um, in a, in a rapid uh, time frame. It's just so important. Thank you so much to our panelists, David, Rom, Kenrick. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Natalie, for um, all the admin help getting this up and running. Um, I don't see any other questions, so maybe we'll conclude. Thank and you, I, everyone. I can put in a last plug for, oh, the, uh, for, for, the, for the CTSI for, 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 for anyone who is, is planning on designing a, a, a study. This, the CTSI has a lot of different resources available to, to help. You know, I, I represent the biostatistics program and we, we offer free help um, with grant writing, um, including you know, power calculation, study design is one, one of the main things we help on with, with grant preparation, but um, also with analytic plans and, and data management plans. So, so we're uh, available and, and without charge. Um, and there's, there's a, a number of other programs. Um, Catherine, maybe you can give a plug for your program. Yeah, I realized I should have done that earlier. Thank you. Uh, I wanted you to have a last word, but okay. Um, so in our special populations core, we will do a mock study section for you. So it helps you get organized in advance. We have great reviewers like Kenrick Duru. And um, it really helps because you, you have a whole internal review before you go to NIH and we have a really good success rate and uh, we're very, we have some really amazing reviewers that can help quite a bit. I just wanna second that. I, I really think, I asked Natalie to look this up, but of the grants I've reviewed, and it's not me, but more than half were funded, I wanna say like 60%. So the, the reviews you get are just so helpful. Um, so I would strongly yeah. recommend, you know, you need all the, the assistance you can get. It's hard to get funded and this is really a terrific resource I would encourage people to take advantage of. Thanks, Kenner. Yeah, and it doesn't have, not just K awards, we review R01s too. And another one. All right, thanks everybody.